I would now like to introduce Dr. David Houston. David is a principal research scientist at Geoscience Australia. David joined Geoscience Australia in 1995 after postdocs at the University of Tasmania and at the Geological Survey of Canada. From his very first project at Geoscience Australia, he considered the formation of mineral deposits in a metallogenic or systems framework. Since then, David has worked collaboratively in each state and territory in Australia in terrains that range from the Paleoarchean to the Cenozoic. David has expertise in metallogenesis at the continental to global scale and applies this for the benefit of the Critical Minerals Mapping Initiative. Thank you, Marina. For my talk, I'm going to be introducing you to the Critical Minerals in Ore dataset and the sorts of analysis that we can do with that data set. Before I move on, I'd like to acknowledge that this is the work of a lot of people, including people from Geoscience Australia, Geological Survey of Canada, and the USGS, but we've also had other involvement from uh, the Geological Survey of Queensland. Okay, before we move on and talk about this, I, I, I'd just like to bring this diagram up, which actually illustrates the production mode of different critical commodities. Okay, in the diagram to the right, you actually see all of the critical commodities based on the USGS, the Geoscience Australia, and the GSC um, critical minerals list. And they're colored by whether they're produced as a byproduct, a co or a main, uh, a co-product, or a main or a co-product. And in the um, table to the left, we actually see an indication of the value of, of, of the critical minerals. And these include rare earth elements, platinum group elements, and a whole suite of things. So as you can see, a lot of the high value critical minerals are actually produced as either a co-product or a byproduct, but there are significant critical minerals which are produced as solely as a byproduct. And the intention of this thing is to actually document the co products and also the byproduct potential of the deposits. So we'll actually move on to the Critical Minerals in Ores database, the CMIO database. It's released today. We have over 7,000 samples from over 60 countries. It's sourced from published data sets including OSNACA and the GAA, GSC and USGS geochemical databases. All of the samples have been classified according to the Hofstra et al. Um, classification scheme, which Al talked about just before. The data includes as many elements as possible along with analytical me metadata. So we've actually got more than two-thirds of the periodic table. It's going to be updated semi-annually. And just to illustrate this, I'm going to just go through a demonstration of the critical minerals um, portal. Okay, this is the, the page that comes up, and I'll just go through some of the features in it. Um, so we're going to actually look at the about, and that tells you uh, what the data set includes and the involvement of other people. Then we've also got some other information, uh, fact sheets, so you can actually download a fact sheet. And this is the general fact sheet about the uh, CMMI, which you can see there. So you can download. There, there's other things that you can download too. So we're going to actually go and look at the, the layers now. So we've got a bunch of layers, uh, the geochemical layers and we're going to look at deposits and geochemistry. Okay, and that tells you a little bit of, about the uh, data set and how to get the data out. Um, so and there's also indicates the legend, um, and you can see all the different shapes and colors indicate different things. And now we're actually going to filter the, da the data. Okay, so the first thing we're going to actually do is filter according to the, ge the deposit environment, and we're going to look for basin hydrothermal deposits. So that's applied that. Now we're going to actually move on. And see, so you've seen it's, it's removed a bunch of uh, deposits. Now we're going to move on to the deposit group. And we're going to look at the uh, hydrothermal uh, or the sediment hosted um, deposits. And so it's actually removed a few more. We'll apply the third filter. And this is all based on the Hofstra et al. classification scheme. And we're going to look at siliciclastic mafic type deposits. And these are things like uh, HYC or red dog. Okay, so we've done that. And we can actually go and search and, and sort by country. And so we're going to actually sort by the United States. And we'll do that. 
And so it actually comes up and you see Red Dog and some deposits in upstate New York when they actually move into uh, Red Dog. And you can actually see a lot of detail about Red Dog. And you can actually see the location of the samples um, that we're looking. You can download the information as a CF CSV or other uh, type of uh, file. Um, and you can actually query the, the actual data set using the tools. And so that's the uh, data from uh, Red Dog, and it illustrates a lot of characteristics, the location, uh, uh, description of the, of, the, of the deposit and the sample, and also the geochemical analyses. We include the actual analysis, the detection limits, and also the method. Okay. Now we're actually going to plot some things up, and so we're going to actually use the geochemical tools, and so we're going to use a, uh, a data set, so we're going to look at Red Dog, as we said before, and we're going to plot up some box and whiskers, that's the actual uh, samples that have been pulled out of the database, and you can see uh, a box and whisker plot just down there, and you can actually use a number of different things, and you can also use a log scale. Okay, so that's at log scale, and we've actually uh, brought it out. And you can see that red dock, as you expect, is enriched in zinc. It's also enriched in sulfur and barium. It's also enriched in a whole bunch of other things. Um, and then we can actually go back and download the information as a CSV or et cetera. So we're going to actually plot the CSV uh, file, and you can actually bring the CSV fo uh, file out, and this is what you get. Hopefully. And so that provides you a lot of information about the sample and also the geochemical analyses that you can see here. And that's what you get when you download the thing. So that's a very brief introduction to how the portal um, works. Um, and hopefully you'll enjoy looking at it and get some information out of it. Now I'm going to talk about some of the potential uses of the debate database. And one of the more important things is actually classifying deposit types. And what we have here are iron oxide copper gold deposits split up into iron hematite rich and magnetite rich. Okay, as you can see, and these are Australian examples. Um, and this shows the Olympic Dam in comparison with Prominent Hill. And as you can see, there's a large overlap between the analyses of both, deposit type, of both deposits. However, if we go to comparing Olympic Dam with Ernest Henry, which is a magnetite dominant system, we actually see some important differences. First of all, the Olympic Dam deposits are rare earth element and uranium enriched, whereas if you go to Ernest Henry, you find a different suite of elements which are highly enriched. That would be molybdenum, tungsten, and rhenium. So we can actually use this information to indicate what sort of critical minerals might be associated with the different types of iron oxide copper gold deposits. Another use of the database is assessing critical minerals in ores. This diagram is from uh, unpublished data by Mudd and Werner, and it just illustrates the relationship between molybdenum and rhenium, indicating that rhenium increases as molybdenum increases. The other thing that's just important, you can start to see this in the diagram, is that the rhenium moly uh, ratio is dependent quite strongly on the type of deposits. It turns out that deposits associated with intermediate magmas have higher rhenium molybdenum ratios, whereas deposits associated with felsic magmas have lower rhenium to molybdenum ratios. So we can actually use the classification scheme in this relationship to predict the diff the rhenium concentration of both moly and copper moly ores. Another example that we're going to look at is germanium. Germanium is a minor but a critical mineral. It's used in fiber optics as a semiconductor and as a polymer catalyst. It's more than doubled in, in production from 2000 to 2019. Currently, there are, uh, in 2019, there are about 130 tons um, produced. China is the dominant producer, 65%. The production, however, is not where the resources are. Like for example, Glencore export zinc concentrates to China and Northern Europe, so the rhenium is actually coming from Australia, but it's actually being produced in other countries. The other thing is that the Australian grades and resources are not publicly known. And we can actually use the 
uh, critical minerals database to actually assess this. Okay, so this diagram here um, shows you uh, a scattergram plotting zinc with germanium because germanium is quite commonly a, a produced by uh, treatment of zinc concentrates. But if you can see the diagram, you'll see that there's um, solid blue um, squares versus open symbols. And you can see actually that the solid blue symbols actually have higher concentrations of germanium than the open symbols. And that suggests there's some differences between in germanium contents between different deposit types. And this is just shown um, on the histogram to the uh, left, where you have the Mississippi Valley type, sediment-hosted uh, siliciclastic carbonate, that is things like uh, HYC or red dog, they actually have, are enriched in germanium relative to zinc. In contrast, if you go to sediment-hosted siliciclastic mafic, i.e. Uh, Broken Hill and similar deposits, volcanogenic massive sulfide deposits, and scarring deposits, you will find that the germanium content is much lower. So we can actually use this information to indicate the prospectivity of germanium in different types of ores. But moreover, we can actually use this with zinc resource data to actually estimate the germanium content of different ores. And this just shows a worldwide, a worldwide map indicating by the size of the diagram, by the, by the size of the symbol, the actual uh, amount of germanium that you might predict. And this can actually be understood in terms of geochemistry. And this is a diagram that Yevgeny Basarkov has produced looking at the germanium stability as a function of uh, FO2 and pH at a relatively low temperature. And we think that the germanium-rich deposits are actually very oxidized, and so you can actually reduce those um, fluids and precipitate out germanium, as you can see in the arrow here. So we can actually understand it geochemically, and we can also understand it in terms of where the resources fit. We also do a similar sort of thing in predicting tantalum, niobium, and tin endowments of pegmatite deposits in Western Australia. So you can see the diagram here indicating the different resources uh, that we would predict um, on these critical minerals. And the last example that I'm going to show is cobalt and nickel deposits. Now in Australia we have cobalt being sourced and nickel being sourced from two general types of deposits. We have it, the lateritic nickel deposits and we also have magmatic sulfide nickel deposits. And as you can see here, if you look at the cobalt to nickel ratio of these different deposits, you actually find that the, co uh, the lateritic nickel deposits have higher cobalt contents than the magmatic sulfide deposits. And so this is actually a tool that you can actually indicate where your greater potential for, for cobalt in, in nickel deposits is. We've also looked at critical minerals and phosphorite, and this is work done by uh, Matthew Valetich and, and others. And you can see here is crustal normalized, and this is a, what we call a radar uh, diagram, which just illustrates the relative abundance of uh, critical minerals relative to crustal crust, continental crust. And you can see that phosphorites, and these are in, in the Georgina Basin in, in Queensland are actually quite strongly enriched in rare earth elements, in particular the uh, heavy rare earth elements, which suggests there's a potential for these things to be sources of, of rare earth elements. If you look at the value per ton, as in how much it is worth, you actually see that the different critical, uh, different uh, rare earth elements have different values. So in this case, dysprosium and neodymium and lutetium actually have a significant higher value than most of the other things. So we can actually look at this in a number of different ways. And the last thing that I'm going to talk about is how does this affect the viability of, of, of developing a, a mineral resource. So this is a product of what we um, call the economic fairways tool in Australia. And this just act, actually maps out for a hypothetical um, deposit, the net present value of the deposit as a function of, of depth of cover and also the availability of infrastructure. So we took a typical um, phosphorite deposit and in the, in the left side uh, diagram you see that the prospect or the viability 
shown without rare earth elements, and the reds indicate uh, viable, as in having a, 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 a positive net present value, whereas the blue indicates having a, a negative net present value. But if you look to this other diagram on the right with rare earth elements, you actually find that the net present value actually increases significantly with the incorporation of the rare earth elements. So it actually has a significant or a significant potential effect on the resource viability. Okay, so in conclusion, I've demonstrated to you, hopefully, that the CMMI, CMIO database is one of the largest global databases on orgia chemistry, and it actually has some use. We can use this data to predict the potential source of critical minerals, which is what we as governments are most interested in, but there are a number of other potential uses. First of all, it's, as we've shown, there's a good use of it as a geochemical classification of deposits. It can also be used as deposit scale vectoring, and it also can produce environmental baselines, i.e. what elements are within ores uh, for a number of different types of deposits. What we're going to do in the future? Well, first of all, it's going to be updated at approximately semi-annual basis. Secondly, there's going to be further analysis of data. So we're going to actually look at other critical minerals and predict what sort of concentrations and where we might source those. And we can also look at ore processes, how the ore deposits and the critical minerals uh, formed. In addition, we're going to have some additional tools. I've already demonstrated the radar diagrams. We're going to have a tool like that, which I think is quite useful. And we're going to incorporate live time price information for the critical minerals, because that's actually can be fairly difficult to, to, to obtain. That's it. Thank you.